Connecticut where we didn't do mountains. Um, and I didn't own a pair of hiking boots until I went to college, but I went to college in Oregon where they have mountains. And um, I became a very uh, devoted um, mountaineer in, in those years, not a high level one by any means, but I climbed in, you know, most of the, the glaciated cascades and, and did a lot of rock climbing and enjoyed it tremendously. And uh, one of the things that goes with uh, mountaineering is it has a tremendously rich literature um, written by the participants. You know, it's not like baseball where, you know, the great baseball writers, Roger Angel for the New Yorker and others are watching from the stands. If you want to find out about the, the first descent of Everest, uh, you have to read uh, what's written by the participants, by the people who were on the ground. And fortunately, a lot of them were actually uh, quite good writers. So I got hooked on, on mountaineering and then mountaineering literature and mountaineering history all by the time I was in my early um, 20s. And uh, then I came back east to go to graduate school, um, start teaching, and uh, put that aside as a you know a past interest. I still try to do some mountaineering and get out west occasionally. And, and now that I'm up in upstate New York, uh, climbing, especially uh, when my son was uh, here, not off to college and, and elsewhere, uh, we did a lot of climbing in the Adirondacks. But it occurred to me that you know this this childhood. Um, not childhood, but adolescent um, interest of mine would be a good topic to turn to. I'd written about the 60s. I'd written about all kinds of things. And I, about the turn of the millennium, I decided if I haven't said it now about the 1960s, I'm not really going to say it. So let someone else take, tackle that topic. Well, that's and so I started research on a book about Himalayan mountaineering, and that led me to three books now, the, the most recent one, being Winter Army, the history of the 10th Perfect. Division. Perfect. Say so, thank you, everyone, for joining us. I'm Lee Wright. I'm the founder of History Camp. I'm near Boston. And with me in Virginia is? Hi, I'm Carrie Lund. I'm the director of The Pursuit of History. And we're excited to have with us tonight Morris Isserman. He is an American history professor at Hamilton College in Clinton, New York. And in addition to Winter Army, he has written two other histories related to mountaineering, as he was just mentioning. They include Fallen Giants and Continental Divide. So tonight we're gonna dive into his most recent book, Winter Army, the World War II Odyssey of the 10th Mountain Division, America's Elite Alpine Warriors. Thank you so much for joining us, Morris. My pleasure, Carrie. Well, I, I, we have so many people who are very interested in, in World War II Yet this is an aspect of World War II that's really not been written about much, but I think as you'll take us through tonight, uh, was a very important part of, of uh, history and, and the Allies' success there. Um, do you want to go back to how you got connected to this particular sure. topic? Well, first of all, I was always interested in World War II because I was born in 1951, and like you know, every kid, certainly every boy, but um, I... Uh, was the child of a veteran. My uh, father had served in the army in, in um, those are his dog tags in World War II. And uh, he didn't go overseas. He was older. Um, but, and I grew up with all the World War II movies, The Great Escape, The Longest Day, uh, and, and, and so on. And so I, I was early on hooked on, hooked on history because um, we couldn't drive by a historical marker without stopping to read it. Uh, in my family, um, but also hooked on World War II. But again, I, I didn't write about World War II, um, except uh, indirectly. I did a book um, earlier uh, in this millennium about Walter Cronkite, who before he became a CBS correspondent, a television broadcaster, was a print journalist uh, for the United Press International uh, based in Britain during the Battle of Britain and, and during the invasion of uh, Europe. So I, I, I touched on um, World War II, but I'd never written um, a military history. So I, I came into this topic sort of through the back door, through the connection that the 10th Mountain Division had um, with the world of mountaineering. And many of them were, were, were skiers or climbers. Uh, or otherwise engaged in the outdoors before they joined the 10th Mountain Division. 
uh, and after the war, uh, particularly in the ski industry, they, uh, veterans of the 10th Mountain Division were very important in, in turning skiing into a mass participation sport, which it had not been in the United States before the Second World War. There's one other connection. And Carrie, could we see the Don Potter photograph? That may take a minute to come up. Uh, but I well, I'll start talking about it. Don Potter um, was uh, there. There he is in 1945 uh, with uh, his bride, obviously, Carol Chapel, uh, his high school sweetheart. Uh, Don grew up, was born in Utica, grew up in Saranac Lake um, in, in the Adirondacks, learned to ski there and uh, went to Williams College where he joined the ski team. And most skiers um, before the uh, Second World War in the United States had some kind of connection with a ski team or that came from a ski area. Uh, but again, you know, skiing was, was a very much an, an elite activity. Not many people did it. It was the Great Depression. It was expensive. But Don was, was one of those who, who did it. And, and when the 10th comes into existence, we can talk more about that. Uh, they went out in particular to recruit uh, skiers like, like um, Don. And Don, was uh, when he came back, went to uh, Williams College again, finished his undergraduate degree, and then he got a graduate degree as a geologist and came to Hamilton to teach. And he was here for 30 or more years before I arrived in 1990. And he was kind of a mentor to young faculty like I was then. Um, and so we became friends and he would start to tell me stories about his training with the 10th Mountain Division uh, during uh, World War II. He uh, served in Italy in the fighting as a lieutenant. But before that, he trained at uh, Camp Hale in, in the Colorado Rockies. And after the war, immediately after the war, he never told me about the fighting, and that was pretty typical of World War II veterans. He didn't even tell his family about the fighting. Um, he, so the stories he told were all happy stories. Uh, and uh, one of them was right after the fighting in Italy ended, he got leave and he traveled to Chamonix in the French Alps. And he was the first person to climb Mont Blanc after the Second World War, because there wasn't a lot of recreational climbing during the German occupation, as you can imagine. And he carried his skis on his back. And so he climbed Mont Blanc and then he skied down 15,000 15, feet down to, to Chamonix. So yeah, it was kind of an awesome tale. And, you know, I really love those stories and I, I um, uh, it, it planted a seed and I started to run into other 10th Mountain Division veterans. Uh, one of them uh, at a Reed College alumni event. Uh, I was a class of 1973 and I met someone named Harris Duesenberry who was class of 1936. And he had gone into the 10th Mountain Division as well. And we were at an we were selling our respective books at this alumni event. And I had a book out in the sixties and I gave him one and he had a book about his 10th mountain experience and he gave me one. Um, so the book itself, my book, Winter Army is dedicated to the memory of um, both of these veterans. Harris Duesenberry recently died at age 101 and um, Don Potter died just a few years ago at age 95 and he was he died he was out skiing at 95 and took a fall and um and died a week later but if you got to go the, that's kind of the way the way to go so the, the, meeting some exceptional um, veterans of the 10th and just being intrigued by the, the connection between this US army uh, unit something that never existed before the united states had never had mountain troops or ski troops before and a world I knew better and, and felt very attached to, the world of outdoor recreation, uh, mountaineering, and skiing, um, made it a very appealing uh, topic for me to turn to. So what was the impetus for the Army starting this group? Yeah, the impetus, interestingly, uh, came from a civilian group uh, and a particular guy uh, named Charles Minot Dole, or Minnie Dole, as he was known to his friends, who was the founder and director of something called the National Ski Patrol, uh, which was founded in the 1930s um, to patrol uh, ski resorts, uh, which were beginning to be created. Uh, and up until that point, although there had been European 
ski patrols. Uh, there hadn't been any in the U.S. And skiing, you know, people fall down, they break their legs, and you you need to bring them medical attention, and you need to know how to get them down off the slopes. And so the ski patrol soon had thousands of members in in uh, ski resorts and from Vermont to Colorado to uh, the Pacific Northwest. And one day in 1940, Minnie Dole was sitting uh, after a long day skiing in um, near Stowe Mountain in Vermont and um, uh, talking with some of his friends. And they were noticing that the war in Europe, which had begun in 1939, uh, and the United States was not yet part of, wouldn't be part of until December 41, but that uh, various sides were deploying mountain troops because there's a long tradition of having mountain troops, especially on the continent, where France and um, Germany and Austria and Italy all have borders that run along the ridgelines and the, the summits of uh, the Alps. There have been a lot of fighting in the Alps uh, between uh, Italy and Austria-Hungary in um, the First World War. And many and his friends um, bemoaned the fact that the United States had had no such troops. And, and looking ahead um, with great foresight and, and imagining that the United States couldn't stay out of the war forever, uh, they thought the Army should begin um, training mountain troops uh, who could climb, who could ski, who could survive in, in cold weather, who would uh, have special training and techniques and, and equipment. Uh, and so, um, not being shy, Minnie was an insurance executive in Greenwich, Connecticut. Uh, he was kind of New England gentry. He was used to taking control. He wrote to another product of Northeastern gentry, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and said, Dear President Roosevelt, you know, here's the situation as we see it. Uh, uh, shouldn't we look into having uh, mountain troops of our own? And Roosevelt forwarded it to um, George C. Marshall, the Army Chief of Staff, uh, and uh, to Henry Stimson, the Secretary of War. And it, it's a long, complicated process. But um, uh, in November 1941, the 87th Mountain Infantry Regiment, which would be the core of what became the 10th Mountain Division, was activated at um, Fort Lewis in Tacoma, uh, Washington, and began training. And that, of course, was only a few weeks before Pearl Harbor. <laughs> And then uh, take us through then from the, from the training to ultimately the engagement in Europe. Right. Uh, got a few hours. <laughs> Maybe hit, hit a little of the high, a few of the high points and then let's get to Europe, right? Well, let me t say uh, first some of the things that made the 10th Mountain Division unique. Um, the Army didn't know how to recruit skiers and mountaineers uh, particularly. And Mini Dole's thought was that it would be easier to make soldiers out of skiers than to make skiers out of soldiers. And so the army, uh, for the first time ever in its history, uh, appointed a civilian agency, the National Ski Patrol, to do its recruiting uh, for this new mountain division. And so people had to write to the National Ski Patrol headquarters in New York City and include three letters of recommendation. It was like applying for college. Um, and indeed, many of their applicants, like m my uh, colleague and friend Don Potter, were coming out of college. They were coming out of college ski teams, or, or they were alumni of colleges like Dartmouth uh, that had ski teams. Um, and uh, they played that role uh, for, for the next two years. And then the, uh, they recruited basically every available uh, skier or mountaineer, and then the Army started sending in some uh, flatlanders, uh, people without previous ski experience. Uh, but the core of the division was um, drawn from this this pretty well-educated, uh, pretty socially elite um, background. And one of the things this meant was it was, again, it was all volunteer in the beginning, uh, sort of like uh, paratroopers. Uh, the Army had no, there was no 101st Airborne or 82nd Airborne in 1939, those were created over the next couple of years. Um, but no, no, well, very few uh, of the uh, men who joined those units had ever jumped out of an airplane before. I mean, there wasn't civilian parachuting, it was not a thing. Uh, but here's the, the um, 10th Mountain Division. 
and you've got all of these privates in basic training and they already have their specialized training skills. And in fact, they're better at it than their non-coms, their sergeants, uh, who are regular army, uh, who were sent in from flatland units uh, from an army that before the war was largely a kind of tropical army. It was based in Hawaii. It was based in the Southern army bases. It was based in the Caribbean. And so you often had um, buck privates uh, instructing, you know, colonels in, in the 10th Mountain Division on just how to ski, uh, which made for a, a, a kind of unusual military experience. That's not quite typical of, of how army units train. So anyway, these guys, uh, they begin their training at Fort Lewis and uh, on Mount Rainier, and they, they train, and Mount Rainier is a national park, and they take over a civilian um, ski resort in the national park, and uh, they have private rooms, <laughs> at least at, in the very beginning, um, which is not the typical army barracks. And they're, they're, they're training up there. The problem with training in a national park is um, they, they could do their ski training, but you're not allowed to discharge a weapon inside a national park. If you're training a military unit, it's pretty useful to be able to you know, learn how to fire a rifle, not to mention a machine gun or an artillery piece. And so the Army um, decided to build a special camp, purpose-built camp, uh, high in the Colorado Rockies near Leadville, Colorado. Uh, in a, there was a little train station called Pando, uh, and not much else in this this high alpine valley, uh, the Eagle Valley, and it had it had the advantage of having a train running through it from Denver up to Leadville and, and other places in the Colorado um, interior. And that base became Camp Hale and opened its doors late in 1942 to the 10th Mountain Division. So from November December of 1942 through the spring of 1944 the 10th mountain division expanded from the, the original 87th Re mountain infantry regiment it acquired two more regiments uh the 86th and the 85th and auxiliary units uh and it grew to division size which in world war ii was roughly 15,000 men uh and it trained at very high altitude i mean they were the camp was at 9,000 feet and the surrounding mountains uh, in the, that part of the Colorado Rockies are up to 14,000 feet. So they were um, constantly doing maneuvers uh, through the winter um, on top of these very wintry peaks. And, and it was a, a rigorous uh, training, to, to say the least. Um, and of course, it's, uh, the, the other people who joined the, the 10th were uh, European refugees, ski instructors. Um, the, the best place to learn how to ski, uh, according to the highest Austrian standards or Swiss standards in World War II was at Camp Hale. You had the, you know, the most experienced uh, ski instructors in the world. So these guys, uh, during the winter, they obviously in the summer, they, they trained in the mountain climbing, they trained in weapons, and they learned everything else you needed to learn to be a good soldier. But they would ski all week in training and then on the weekends when they had you know two-day passes they would go off uh to aspen which was about 70 miles away or some other nearby ski resorts and they would ski recreationally and some of them you know seeing aspen aspen was a kind of rundown mining town which had a primitive ski lift uh vowed to come back after the war uh to um, turn aspen into what it is today which is a first class world-class uh, ski resort. So they're there and they're training and um, training and training and wondering when they're going to get into the war. And uh, the army, although it had created mountain troops, had been persuaded by the argument they were needed, um, couldn't quite figure out what to do with them. I mean, they were, they were different than a regular army division. Uh, they, for one thing, they had mules. Um, I mean, they had jeeps and they had trucks. But uh, if you're going to go up high in the Rockies, you, you're not going to get up there in a jeep. Uh, and they figured if they're going to go high in the Alps or wherever they were going to be dispatched to, they were also going to need to have mules. So uh, another specialized group that joined the 10th in those years were Missouri mule skinners uh, who came because they were experienced handling mules. 
uh, every soldier in the 10th was supposed to know how to pack a mule and lead a mule. And mules are pretty ornery animals. And a lot of them really hated the experience of their, their, their mule training. But anyway, they're, they're watching the war unfold and they're eager to go to war. I mean, they're, they're nothing if not um, dedicated. Uh, but the army looks at them and there's all those mules. Their weapons are lighter. Um, they have 35 caliber machine guns instead of 50 caliber machine guns and 75 um, millimeter uh, artillery rather than 105s or 155s because what can you haul up into the mountains? It has to be lighter. And so those those were kind of deal breakers for unimaginative generals. Um, and uh, it, it might have been that they would have kept training and training and training forever and never never gotten sent into combat. In fact, a number of them transferred out uh, into military intelligence or into other units that were uh, being sent uh, to, to fight in Europe by 1943, 1944. Finally, it dawned on somebody in the Pentagon that the fighting in Italy, which was very difficult. Um, Winston Churchill had said, oh, we should attack Italy before France uh, because um, it's the soft underbelly of the Axis powers, uh, which uh, the American invasion, the Allied invasion, American, British, Canadian, Polish, and others, uh, in 1943 knocked Italy out of the war, but the Germans occupied you know, most of uh, northern central Italy. And Italy is anything but a soft underbelly. It's very mountainous. It has narrow coastal plains. It has a, a larger plains area around Rome. But it took the Allies from September 43 till late spring 44, when they were fighting in the mountains all that winter around Monte Cassino, for example, famously, uh, to break through to Rome, they capture Rome, they capture Florence. Um, but then there's another uh, range of mountains, the Northern Apennines. And the Germans are very, they're very good on the offensive, but they're also very good on the defensive. And they have mountain troops and they know what they're doing. And they set up a, a, what seems to be an impenetrable uh, set of defenses, which was called the Gothic Line through the Northern Apennines. And, and the Allies uh, made attempts, attempt after attempt to break through the Northern Apennines in the, that uh, winter of 44, 45 into 45 uh, without success. And finally, finally, the 10th Mountain Division, which had been training for you know nearly three years, uh, is loaded onto troop ships uh, in Newport News, Virginia, and sent across the Atlantic into the Mediterranean uh, and disembark at Naples, uh, the port of Naples, in December 44 and January of 45. They come over in, th in three different troop ships and are then deployed along the um, Gothic line, uh, ready to bring the war to the Germans uh, in that winter of 45. So had there been fighting uh, on the Allied side up in the mountains before the arrival of the 10th Mountain Division? Right, well, I mean, the most famous example is uh, in the winter of 43, 44 in Monte Cassino, uh, where there were successive attacks for five months uh, by Americans and, and Poles and uh, Canadians and others. Uh, the Air Force wound up blowing up the 13th century Benedictine monastery on the top, figuring that the Germans were sheltering in it, which actually they weren't. Uh, nothing seemed to work. Finally, it was French mountain troops, free French mountain troops, who launched the decisive attack that, that broke the German line there at Monte Cassino and allowed um, the Allied forces to pour into the, the uh, relatively flat lands around Rome and Florence. And once you're out of the mountains, the Allied advantage in armor, in tanks, and in air power uh, could be deployed uh, to full benefit. Uh, it, once you could f fight on relatively flat land, then the balance of power shifted. But as long as you're in the mountains, um, and you're dug in, you know, into these deep bunkers and you have your artillery sighted on all the approaches and you've mined the, the mountain paths and um, the, the Germans proved very difficult to dislodge. So it was the 10th Mountains assignment uh, 76 years ago in 1945, um, in uh, January, February, uh, their signature battles take place on um, a couple of eminences called um, Riva Ridge and Mount Belvedere. 
and Riva Ridge and Mount Belvedere overlooked one of the few highways that um, in those years cut through um, the northern Apennines. And once you're out of the Apennines, you're back on flat land. You're in the Po Valley, the P.O. Valley, uh, and major uh, industrial cities, Bologna and Milan. Uh, it's the agricultural breadbasket of Italy. Uh, and it's the road to the Alps and to the Brenner Pass. And through the Brenner Pass in, in the Alps, um, you can then um, cross over into Austria, which was then, of course, part of uh, Nazi Germany. So it was crucial to capture these high points, which the Germans had artillery and artillery spotters on top of. And uh, there had been several attempts in the fall, November, December of 1944, with uh, regular army divisions to, to do it, and they, they were unsuccessful. Uh, and so the 10th uh, was given this essential mission, if there was going to be a breakout in Italy, of capturing those high points. And so on, beginning on February 18th, 1945, um, especially trained rock climbing troops uh, scaled unnoticed by the Germans up a very steep cliff. The Germans didn't bother to, to guard it. They didn't bother to mine it because they figured no no Americans could get up it. Uh, but about 700 men from the 10th Mountain Division scaled the mountain in the middle of the night, captured the German outposts, and then held against repeated German counterattacks for days afterwards. And the very next night on February 19th, um, 10,000 men from the division uh, began to climb up uh, the Belvedere Massif, which were three peaks, Mount Belvedere, um, and Mount Della Terraccio, and I'm blanking on the, the middle peak. It'll come to me. Um, and in five days of heavy fighting uh, on those, those uh, mountain peaks, they um, uh, drove the Germans off and again held off against repeated um, counterattacks. And this changed the entire complexion of uh, the struggle in the northern Apennines because you could now move your tanks and your trucks um, and masses of infantry up uh, those roads or that, that particular road through the northern Apennines and perch at the edge of the Apennines um, to launch a spring offensive. And so there was fighting um, still in the Apennines in uh, March the 10th, always in the vanguard. And the general um, offensive uh, across northern Italy, which involved the British uh, to the east and the Americans uh, and other units to the west, um, was launched on April in, uh, in the West. It was launched on April the 14th. And again, the 10th Mountain Division was in the vanguard. Uh, they were the first to break into the Po Valley. And then, although they were mountain troops, they fought on flat land. Uh, they just kept, they were the spearhead. They were the sharp end of the spear uh, all the way up uh, to uh, Lake Garda, which is a famous resort lake, uh, where Mussolini, who was deposed, but the Germans had rescued and installed him as a kind of puppet dictator on the shores of Lake Garda. Uh, the, the 10th uh, captured Lake Garda. They captured Riva del Garda, uh, a resort town at the very northern end of, of um, uh, Lake Garda. And in doing that, they, they basically shut off the German retreat. There were a quarter million German soldiers still in Italy, and what Allied commanders feared was that they would be um, pulled back across the Brenner Pass uh, into Austria, and they would set up what was called the, the Redoubt or the Alpine Redoubt. And uh, the fear was that Hitler would flee Berlin uh, and uh, come to Berchtesgaden or uh, the region, and the Germans would dig in, and it would take months more of heavy fighting to drive them out. Now, in the reality is, Hitler decided to die in Berlin. The Red Army was closing in from the east. Um, the Americans had crossed the Rhine in March, so they were closing in on central Germany. The decisive battle, the, the, the war-ending battle, was taking place um, in northwestern Europe, not, at, not in Italy. Uh, but uh, the Allies felt, the commanders felt they couldn't take the chance of um, the Germans pulling out of Italy and, and getting their troops into defensive positions in the high Alps. So that was the, the, the role of the 10th. They were never given an objective, which they didn't capture. They were never driven off of an objective like um, Riva Ridge or Mount Belvedere that they had captured. And again, they were in, in the vanguard, the, 
uh, entire um, uh, last few months of the war. The war in Italy uh, ends officially on May 2nd, so the surrender is five days before um, the German forces uh, still fighting in, within Germany um, surrender. And they paid a heavy price for it. Uh, a division, again, is about 15,000 men. Nearly 1,000 10th Mountain um, soldiers died in the fighting. Uh, and that's just between um, February and the end of April. And 4,000 more, uh, including Bob Dole, who was a young replacement lieutenant, from guy from Kansas. He'd never seen a mountain, but they were uh, bringing uh, uh, non-mountain trained soldiers into the tent as the 10th took casualties. Uh, who was badly um, wounded uh, during the spring offensive and um, carry, carried the wounds, uh, lost use of uh, his arm uh, for, for the rest of his life, and who, of course, later famously became senator from Kansas and the Republican presidential candidate in um, 1996. Uh, so all told, um, about 5,000, that's out of 15,000, um, soldiers in the 10th Mountain Division were casualties of uh, those two, two and a half months of fighting uh, in Italy in the closing days of the war. That's fascinating. Uh, quite, a, quite an image of uh, those American troops scaling that uh, yeah. wall and uh, surprising, I'm sure. <laughs> Probably an understatement, the, the German yeah. troops there. Um, <clears throat> what was the... Um, so, so after, after the war and so forth, what did the army do with the, the, the 10th Mountain Division? Did, did they realize that this time they should, uh, uh, you know, keep some troops around and so forth? No. <laughs> Short uh, answer is no. Uh, the 10th Mountain Division, well, okay, uh, so these guys are fighting in Italy and the war is coming to an end. They don't think their war is coming to an end. They they were slated to take part in the invasion of Japan. And in August um, of 1945, um, they're loaded on troop ships in Naples, I, I think late July, and they uh, return via the Mediterranean and the Atlantic, and, and they arrive in New York City. And I think the first troop ship um, arrives in New York Harbor on August the 6th, which is Hiroshima Day. Uh, and so it's only the um, abrupt end of the war following the use of atomic weapons against Hiroshima and Nagasaki that spared the ten men of the 10th Mountain Division, of course, lots of other um, uh, Marine and, and Army, uh, Navy and units as well from invading Japan, which was scheduled for November of 1945, in which everyone knew after the fighting on Iwo Jima and, and Okinawa in the spring of 45, in particular, everyone knew that was going to be a terrible bloodbath. Um, uh, uh, Carrie, could we see that photo of Don Potter again? When you get the chance. So these guys get back and, and suddenly, you know, their lives unfold um, before them. Uh, I mean, they're going to have a, a life. And among them, um, Second Lieutenant Don Potter, who, uh, again, didn't talk about the fighting, but while he was in uh, Italy, uh, was awarded a Purple Heart and a Bronze Star for heroism in battle uh, and for being wounded. And he gets to marry his, his childhood sweetheart, Carol Chapel, who, it turns out, was also engaged in war work during the war, very hush hush. She was in, uh, in Washington D.C. Uh, involved in um, decrypting the uh, projects to um, break the enemy code and, and so forth. And so here they are, this very young couple. I think Don is 21 or 22 when the photo is taken, and obviously very happy to be reunited. Uh, and they would go on to live a long life together and have uh, four children. I think uh, so the men of the 10th got got the the ones who didn't die in Italy got to to have an, a second life no second acts in american life but in this case uh they 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 got one uh but the army um you know against they had proved themselves in combat but the army just still didn't know what to do with them and was 
qu quickly decided, you know, this is just a wartime anomaly. And so in, in November of 1945, um, the 10th Mountain Division was officially disbanded. And there was some um, cold weather troops who trained in the, in the 1950s, uh, but no designated um, mountain troops. Uh, and there wouldn't be again until um, 1983 or four, I'm for blanking on the, the right year, but uh, the army recreated the 10th Mountain Division uh, as a light infantry. They're not formally de designated as a mountain division or ski troops, and, and they don't do skiing as part of the training anymore. Uh, they're based at Fort Drum uh, up here in upstate New York, very near the Canadian border. Um, and they um, uh, are the most deployed unit in the U.S. Army since the 1980s. Because if you think about where the U.S. Army has been fighting in places like Afghanistan, Iraq, um, and, and, and elsewhere, uh, you need light infantry units. Um, you know, they no longer have mules. They, they go into battle fair and their supplies are ferried by helicopter and so forth, but they're trained for rough terrain. They're trained for cold weather. Um, and they're very, they still wear the same insignia that the, the original 10th mountain, uh, war, and they're very, very, um, aware of their connection, uh, with their world war II forebears. One of the book talks I gave, the book came out in the fall 2019, and I uh, went up to um, Fort Drum uh, to uh, give a talk to soldiers there. Uh, there's a 10th Mountain History Museum, very good museum, on base. And uh, the director of the base uh, was interested in my book and, and brought me up to, to talk to about 100 um, young men and women in uniform who, as it turned out, were um, had received their orders not long before to deploy to Afghanistan. And I noticed they just, their unit just recently um, uh, came back to uh, Fort Drum. And so I'm telling the story as, as I'm telling it tonight of uh, the 10th Mountain Division's um, uh, introduction to combat uh, to these young men and women, and some of whom would have been veterans of previous deployments, but many of whom were going off for the first time into a war zone. And it was, um, and they asked great questions afterwards. It was a very moving experience to, to have the opportunity to do that. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. I have, I have one uh, short question, and then I think Carrie will join us, and I think we've got questions from, from viewers. Uh, so they, this is, this is a group that was new. With it, right, the training and everything else. How did they feel like they? Uh, were equipped, I say that generally, to, to, to their task, uh, especially against troops that were, um, you know, had a, had a great deal of experience in, in, in alpine conditions? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good question. I mean, they were um, trained to be skiers. They were kind of celebrated. Life magazine loved them. They kept doing feature stories about the 10th and their training. You know, the ski troopers, it was very romantic. Um, they got to be really good skiers. And then they got to Italy, and the army didn't bother to ship their skis over. Um, and they they scrounged together some skis and some you know other equipment, some winter white camouflage uniforms, and they sent them out um, on ski patrol um, to you know search out the German lines, maybe to capture a prisoner, do a reconnaissance or whatever. And they had trained in the Colorado Rockies, where you have you know many deep feet of powder snow. And you can pass through relatively quietly. You know, you, the skis go shh, shh, shh. But in um, uh, the Apennines, where you're, you know, at 4,000 feet uh, or lower, uh, you have what's called corn snow. It's kind of like what you get in New England and the Adirondacks, where the snow freezes and then melts and freezes again. And when you go through it and your skis go scritch, 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 scritch. And um, the Germans, of course, could hear them coming a mile away and would, didn't have to see them. They just fired in the direction of, of where this racket was coming from. And so the soldiers, you know, who spent three years training on skis, quickly ditched the skis and realized they were impractical for um, uh, combat. But the ski training was not um, a waste in the sense that these were extremely fit soldiers. Um, and um, again, 
prepared to fight in the mountains. Uh, and they had a very high unit morale. They were great green soldiers when they went into combat. They'd never heard a gun fired in anger. Um, but they performed, you know, beyond expectation. They performed like veteran soldiers. And and so the, the ski training they received was not was not useless. They trained with other equipment, um, the uh, something called a weasel, which was a tracked winter vehicle and is the ancestor of today's snowcats, which you find at, at uh, ski resorts. Um, and uh, so, so, so some of the specialized equipment uh, they, they used was suited to the terrain, um, but not the skis so much. How interesting. Well, Carrie, are you able to join us? And um, I like I said, it looks like we've got some questions from, from viewers. We do. All right. We have a viewer who would like to know if they were, when they started their training, was it at Paradise or Sunrise on Mount Rainier? Paradise. Okay. They were in the Par Paradise Resort buildings, which I've never been to, but from the, the photographs looked quite luxurious. Okay. Good place to start then. <laughs> All right, another question. Why was there no air support in the mountains? Well, there was air support, but of course the Germans were dug in. I mean, they were they were ready for it. And they were not really um, visible. Uh, I visited uh, Riva Ridge and uh, Mount Belvedere in the summer, not in the winter. And it's a very rugged terrain. Um, you know, there's no way you could have rolled a tank up there. Uh, and uh, the Germans would have been all but invisible um, to uh, a fighter pilot or a fighter bomber from above. They could you know, drop their bombs um, randomly. Uh, so um, the, the, the mountain terrain really negated the great material advantage uh, that the Allied armies possessed by that point. Okay. And we have a viewer who would like to know, would this division have been useful in Korea? I'm not sure how mountainous it is, but I know that it gets very cold there. It would have been useful in Korea, and it is very mountainous. And, um, you know, when uh, the United Nations forces crossed into North Korea um, in September 1945 and drove north, and they were driving they hoped to uh, overturn the Korean regime and drive all the way up to the Yalu River, uh, which bordered with China. But the Chinese weren't going to stand for that. And so they crossed the frozen Yalu into the interior, into the mountains. And from that mountain fastness in, in the center of Korea, they launched a devastating counterattack against uh, American forces, uh, British forces, soldiers and Marines, a famous battle at the Chosen Reservoir, which was a mountain mountain setting. Um, so yeah, I mean, it would have been useful to have a cold weather unit that, that was trained in mountain fighting. Um, but, you know, everybody's a military expert in retrospect, like me. So. Right, definitely. All right. Well, this has been very interesting. We learned a lot tonight. Thank you so much. Okay. And we have a link to Morris's book in the chat. So make sure you check that out where you can, of course, learn a whole lot more that we didn't have time to cover tonight. If you would like to join the Pursuit of History or learn how you can support the Pursuit of History, you can do that at thepursuitofhistory.org. And then join us next week. We will be talking on March 4th with author William C. Davis about the Battle of New Orleans at the end of the War of 1812. See you then. Good night.